So now that we have a basic understanding of sequence alignments, let's now talk about more realistic uh, scoring schemes for those alignments. So an important point that I want to make here is that one of the one of the primary goals of sequence alignment historically anyways is to um, basically help identify uh, homologous sequences. Uh, so one of the first applications of sequence alignment is really this idea that you know you sequence a new genome or a new gene and you want to find homologous uh, copies of that gene in other organisms. And so you would use sequence alignment to find other sequences in a database of uh, gene sequences, um, other homologous copies of that gene. And so if your goal is to, for example, give high scores to pairs of, you know, to uh, pairs of sequences that are homologous, then one way that uh, you should do that is by making scoring schemes that tend to reflect how genomes evolve. And so what I mean by that is, for example, um, uh, transition. So when you when you talk about uh, genome evolution, um, transitions, at least in humans, anyways, transitions tend to occur more frequently than transversions. And so if you want an alignment that captures that notion, then you should uh, essentially penalize transversions more highly than transitions because they they do tend to be more rare, and so they shouldn't happen in sequence alignments as often. Uh, similarly, uh, in terms of genetic variation across populations like humans, um, you tend to get uh, substitutions or basically what look like mismatches in your alignment uh, rather than indels which produce gaps. And so your uh, and so real world uh, alignment real world alignment scoring schemes will tend to penalize introduction of gaps um, more than, for example, just mismatches in an alignment. Uh, and finally, it's also worth noting that um, for, for DNA sequencing technologies, usually mismatches or substitutions tend to happen more frequently, um, or sorry, not substitutions, uh, sequencing errors tend to uh, lead to uh, single base pair changes uh, rather than introduction of gaps. And so gaps are typically more penalized than mismatches for that reason also. And so for a similar reason, uh, you can easily see that if you're talking about aligning uh, protein coding uh, sequences uh, of two proteins, uh, you can definitely see why not all substitutions or not all edits should be treated equally. So for example, uh, changes that uh, lead to synonymous codons uh, being swapped from one another are typically more likely to occur because they don't have, they typically don't have um, as you know, large of a functional effect as uh, non-synonymous mutations. Um, so non-synonymous mutations therefore typically get penalized more highly than synonymous uh, mutations. And uh, mutations that lead to that would are predicted to lead to, uh, say, introduction of hydrophilic residues in the hydrophobic protein core should be penalized more uh, highly than. Um, swapping one hydrophobic residue for another uh, inside hydrophobic core. And so here's an example of uh, a more realistic um, scoring uh, scheme for an alignment uh, used in real life. And so here, for example, like larger values mean uh, stronger penalization. And so here, for example, transitions again are penalized uh, not as badly as transversions. And so it's worth pointing out, again, going back to the idea of gaps and gaps generally being uncommon in evolution um, or less common than substitutions. Uh, in real world uh, scoring schemes for alignments, uh, people typically ex actually distinguish the idea of a gap opening in an alignment from a gap extension. And so the intuition here is that um, introducing a gap into an alignment is is bad because uh, indels typically happen less frequently than substitutions. Um, but having a gap of say length uh, 50 bases is not actually functionally worse or much worse than having a gap of size 51, right? And so um, typical scoring schemes, when they look in alignment, they penalize a gap by saying, okay, uh, 
if I had to, you know, if I have a gap at a particular uh, region of my alignment in the first place, then I'm going to penalize that with uh, some penalty called G0 in this case, or basically an opening gap cost. And then I'll penalize, but so I'll penalize the existence of a gap, and then I'll penalize the um, uh, gap also in terms of like how long that gap is. So if the gap is only like two bases, then I'll penalize it two times the cost of G1, which is the cost of extending a gap by um, one gap character. And so the total cost that is assigned to a given gap in alignment is basically just uh, this G0 penalty plus uh, G1 times however long uh, or however many gap characters are introduced in that particular gap. And so generally speaking, this G0 or a cost of opening a gap is typically much higher of course, uh, much higher uh, than, for example, G1 to reflect the fact that having a gap is bad, but extending it is not typically as bad as opening one. So up to now, we've been mainly focused on uh, the task of pairwise global sequence alignment, where we have uh, two sequences, X and Y, and we're just trying to find the best uh, alignment of basically all the bases of X to all the bases of Y. Uh, we won't really delve into this topic any further, but uh, there does exist uh, a type of alignment called the local alignment. Where essentially, um, suppose that you have, for example, two genomes that have diverged like hundreds of millions of years apart. And so suppose there's just very, very little sequence identity globally between two genomes. This is one example of a case where you might want a local alignment where you might presume that uh, there exists some uh, smaller segments of your genome, say individual genes that you think are highly conserved uh, between a pair of species, uh, but you think globally the two genomes are very different. And so what a local alignment does is it, it searches for best matches between a pair of sequences X and Y, but they allow those best matches to be only parts of the genome, uh, only parts of either genome actually. And so local alignments really strive to just find matches that are possibly just short matches between pairs of genomes and they allow for more than one partial match essentially. And so in this diagram here that I'm illustrating, I'm just showing you one hypothetical example where the best match, the, the highest scoring alignment between a pair of uh, sequences X and Y is just made up of a smaller basically subsequence from X match to a smaller subsequence of Y. Um, but we don't really need to care about the details of uh, local alignment in, in this particular class. Um, one other situation in which uh, doing local alignments may make sense beyond uh, identifying small conserved uh, gene sequences between genomes is if you have, for example, you're comparing two genomes, but uh, say one of the genomes has undergone, say, rearrangement. Um, and so pairwise global alignments, for example, can't do a very good job uh, detecting inversions normally, for example. So an important consideration when talking about pairwise alignments is the issue of, of p-values, or how do you how do you quantify the statistical significance of a pairwise alignment? And so in our previous lecture on uh, gene set enrichment analysis, I briefly discussed um, how to do a Fisher's exact test, or how do you use permutations in order to compute the a p-value uh, in terms of how significant your overlap is between your gene set that you pull down with a CRISPR screen uh, versus a set of genes which are known to be uh, involved in some pathway or function. And so there, the concept of p-value is pretty well defined. Um, you know, how often do you expect to see an overlap by chance? Um, but here it's a little bit more hazy because the problem is that um, for any pair of input DNA sequences, it's possible to align them as long as you have in a you know a scoring scheme. Um, you 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 know you always produce a best alignment. Uh, whether or not that alignment makes sense or not is another issue. And so part of the other problem is that, as I mentioned earlier in the lecture, um, one of the one of the primary goals of sequence alignment is to help people find homologous sequences, right? So one of its original uses was you know, given a new gene that you sequence from some new organism, you want to look through a database of characterized uh, genomes and, you know, identify homologous, uh, homologous genes in other organisms um, so that you can figure out what's been, um, what's known about that particular gene already.
And so part of the problem is that it's really hard to draw a direct connection between uh, sequence similarity and homology because, for example, if you have a pair of sequences that have converged onto the same sequence, so they, they didn't originate from the same uh, sequence, but they converged onto the same sequence uh, through separate independent means, um, those pair of sequences will have a high alignment score even though they're not homologous. And so... Uh, Basically, the problem is that, uh, yeah, oftentimes people look at high alignment scores and they conclude something about, oh, these sequences are likely to be homologous. But that, that isn't necessarily true. You, you can have highly scoring uh, alignments between pairs of sequences that are not homologous. Um, and so how that relates to the issue of statistical significance is um, the whole point of statistical significance is that a p-value is supposed to tell you something like, oh, um, the chances that I expect to see an alignment score this good by chance is, is very small for small p-values. But the issue we have here is that, you know, how do you define, you know, random chance? How, how do you define uh, what it means to get a score of an alignment this good by chance? Right, and so does by chance mean, oh, if I just took my, you know, one of my sequences and I just tried to align it against just random sequences that I just make up out of my head, um, is that what it is? You know, is that how I should compute p-values? Um, is that how I should generate? Should I be generating like random sequences and just computing scores of the alignment between one of my, uh, you know, one of my sequences and these random sequences to get like a, a so-called null distribution of of alignment scores, um, or should I be really comparing, should I be taking lots of pairs of uh, sequences where I know they're homologous, compute scores uh, between, uh, compute the scores of the alignments between sequences that I know are homologous? And then should I be also comparing and generating alignments between sequences I know that are not homologous and use both of these sets of, of pairs of sequences to get some idea of, okay, what do scores look like if I'm looking at homologous sequences versus non-homologous sequences, um, and so it's it's just you know it's not really clear how you how you you know the whole point of a p-value is that you're doing some kind of permutation to um, and then doing some kind of statistical experiment in order to get some idea of okay what what does my alignment score look like by chance and then use that to compute a p-value but how you how you do that permutation is is not clear. Um, what's even more important is the question, do we, do we really care about statistical significance? And when, when do we care? When do we not care? And so in a lot of applications uh, that we talk about for DNA sequencing in this class, like for RNA sequencing, for example, where you're sequencing short reads um, from transcripts, and then you're aligning those reads back to the genome to figure out, okay, what genes, um, what genes were being expressed based on these short reads that I sequenced. It's not clear that you you care a lot about statistical significance because for you know in a lot of cases when you're dealing with short read alignments, um, the reads are so short that really you're oftentimes asking okay you know given this read that I sequence um, from my experiment, uh, you just want somebody to hand you back a list of locations across the genome where you see an basically an exact match to your entire short read or something very close to an exact match. And so in those kind of situations, it's, you know, wh whether or not, you know, what whether or not a p-value would really help you or really be that informative is, is not really clear because um, if you don't see something that looks like a pretty much exact match, then um, your read probably didn't come from that location on the genome.